Good afternoon, my name is Sharon Farrell. I facilitate the California Landscape Stewardship Network. We're a volunteer-led network of networks uh, focused on growing the practice, the scale and the quality of cross-boundary environmental stewardship across California. The network does this through supporting the advancement of continued thinking, collective action and systems change work in this field. And we share our work through facilitating peer exchange, offering convenings, writing white papers, and working with state, regional, and local leaders. Today's conversation that you're joining builds upon a series of roundtables that we hosted last year in partnership with the Natural Resources Agency. And it brings together agency colleagues, roundtable participants, restoration practitioners, all people like yourself to share updates and conversation around the Cutting Green Tape Initiative. With that, I would like to introduce our facilitator for today, Sean Johnson. Sean teaches at the University of Montana and last year facilitated a number of our roundtables. He also co-leads the National Network for Landscape Conservation and is a steering committee member for the California Landscape Stewardship Network. Okay, Sean, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks so much, Sharon. It's great to see you. It's good to be with all of you who have joined today really grateful for the time that you've marked off on your calendar to be a part of this conversation. It's good to see as people are jumping into the webinar today, the attendee list, a lot of familiar names. I know a lot of good thinking has gone into the Cutting Green Tape initiative, but also the work that you're doing every day. And so just want to acknowledge and thank you for all of that work and how we're coming together now to really explore opportunities to take a look at some of these bigger picture opportunities in front of us and the long-term outcomes that we care about that we know are possible when we work together and think together and learn together. Today, I wanna just go over a couple of quick things before we jump into the content, just really focusing on our agenda, our path, what we wanna to accomplish today, and then quickly get into that content. Our, our focus is really on where are we now? What are some of the updates we want to learn and share with each other? Really thinking about this as an opportunity to provide an update, but also to engage in conversation. And we know that so much of the, the time that we're spending these days is on really understanding how the work that we're doing within our organization or in a particular landscape fits within a bigger picture. And that this is that opportunity to bring those conversations together to think about that opportunity at scale. Looking at the agenda, if we could go to the next slide. Yeah, this is a quick overview of what we want to accomplish in this 90 minutes that we have together today. So in a moment here, I'll be introducing Secretary Crowfoot to share a little bit more from his leadership perspective about what cutting green tape is, what it's accomplishing, and how all of us can be a part of that conversation as we move forward. And then because our focus is on exchange, we wanna provide an opportunity for that. We're going to start with a panel discussion where we're inviting five leadership voices from Cutting Green Tape to come forward to share their thoughts and some updates on what they've been doing to advance and shape Cutting Green Tape and associated initiatives. And then invite you to be a part of that conversation. So as we hear from these leaders and then think about that in the context of your work, if there's something that you'd like to share, you're welcome to share that in the, the chat box, and a, an anecdote or an idea or an update. Maybe you have a link to some recent work on your website, or maybe you'd like to be a part of the conversation as we move forward. So all of those are opportunities that we're gonna make available during that panel discussion. And at that time, I'll, I'll share a little bit more about how to engage your voice in that conversation. And then we'll conclude by just talking about how do you stay engaged moving forward? What are some of those opportunities as we look a few weeks and a few months down the road and how can you stay engaged uh, in this conversation. So with that, um, just wanna make sure that we get a, a moment here before we jump in to learn a little bit more about who's with us here today. And so I'm going to invite our tech team there from behind the scenes to drop a link into the chat box. And the link will take you to a series of just real quick polling questions to help us understand a little bit more about the 193 attendees and, and 10 panelists who have joined us for today's webinar. The first one is a real simple point and click exercise. So once you, once you go to that link that's in, that Samir dropped into the chat box, it will take you to a poll everywhere poll. Once you get there, it may prompt you to sign up or, or put your name in there. I think you can skip that step and go directly into 
Vic, into the questions themselves. Seeing that some people are having a hard time seeing the link, it's it's right there in the chat box at the bottom. Samir just reposted it, so hopefully you can see it then, see it there. If not, let us know. And it's also on the screen at the top there. If you're looking at the screen, it's just that pollev.com forward slash Devin Landry 503. And once you're there, you should be able to click on the map. Looks like some people are just putting your response in the chat box too, which works just as well. So I'm not, Devin, are you seeing, or Samir, who is ever driving that, are you seeing responses? There we go. Wow, look at all the location. You guys have got the state map pretty well covered at this point, and even some people from up in Oregon, over in Idaho. So great to see so many people joining from not just the Bay Area, Northern California, but the Sierras, Southern California, all along the coast, up in the northern part of the state. Fantastic. Well, it's fun to just see that on a map. Great. Let's go ahead and go to the next question, which is just to help us get a sense of your home organization. What's your, your home organizational affiliation? Are you with a government agency, a nonprofit, an academic institution, tribal government foundation, private consultant, anything else? Just recognizing how important all these different voices are in building shared understanding and exploring future opportunity. Still seeing those response bars move a little, move around a little bit. So we'll just take a minute here as those question or as those answers come in. Good. So we see, you know, nearly half the people here from government agencies acknowledging, gosh, there's a wide assortment of different views even within that bucket. Same with the nonprofit world, but Really great to see so many people here from different perspectives who are seeing different elements and, and can make different contributions to the cutting green tape conversation. Let's go ahead and move forward to the next question. We've just got two more quick questions, folks. We wanted to learn a little bit more about how you've been engaged with cutting green tape so far. And so you can actually answer up to three of these, thinking that maybe you've been involved in multiple different opportunities with cutting green tape so far. So what are those and how can we get a little bit more of a, a sense from you all what those are? So maybe you participated in the round tables, maybe you've read the report or attended webinars. There have been other communications out there in forms of newsletters or other media announcements. And then there've been some meetings. I know CDFW has, has hosted meetings recently. So maybe you've been a part of those. And finally, maybe this is your first opportunity to engage with cutting green tape. And so it looks like we've got a few of, of you on the webinar today too, which is fantastic to see. 11% of people, this is your first introduction. So welcome to you all, whether you're new or have been involved from the beginning, it's great to see ongoing engagement and growing engagement from across the state. Good, and one more quick question here, and then we'll move into our program for today. And this is really, a little bit of a transition into the program itself. What is it that you're hoping to gain from this? And again, you can answer up to three of these. So is it more just learning about the initiative itself? Are you interested in the report and its recommendations? Maybe about how you can get involved. Maybe you've got an update that you'd like to share. Maybe it's more around what's happening with state agencies and partners to advance cutting green tape. Or, or some of those next steps. So it looks like a lot of people are really interested in some of these action items. How can we move from some of the work that's gone into cutting green tape conversations and the report into what partners and agencies are doing to advance the work and what's next? So it's great to see all that engagement and interest. Well, good. Well, thank you all for, for jumping in and doing that. It's great to be able to engage you in real time knowing that we've got so many folks on the line, it's, it's hard to hear all of your voices, but at least we get all of your input in that way. So, for, so thank you for doing that. Just wanna turn now to um, our, our first speaker. And I, gosh, I just am so grateful. We recognize that none of this would be hap happening without all of you and that Conversations like this do, don't move forward without focused attention and, and especially state 
level leadership. And our first speaker, Secretary Wade Crowfoot, has provided that statewide leadership and direction from the beginning. Um, it's wonderful that he's here with us again today and can kick things off to share with us his vision on what cutting green tape is and can do, the progress that we've made so far, some latest uh, updates from his perspective, and the hopes that he has for today and moving forward. So Wade, it's, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for being here again. The floor is yours. Hey, thanks so much, Sean. Really appreciate it. And it's great to be with you all here today. I actually wanted to start with a bit of a, uh, a recent experience. Uh, and that is uh, last week. Well, let me start by saying, you know, it's obviously been a, a really challenging last several months for us all. So I want to thank the Landscape Stewardship Network for staying on top of spearheading this cutting green tape effort with us. And thank you all for the work that you continue to do. Um, I can tell you, uh, you know, it's been a professional and personal challenge for all of us as we've navigated this pandemic and remain focused on what we, what, you know, why we do this work. And I was reminded of that last week when I went to San Luis Obispo uh, County with uh, my wife and daughter, uh, Airbnb, remote working, safe way to actually have a change of scenery. And this is actually a photo uh, from one of those mornings and this was uh, our, our trip to the so-called Elfin Forest in Los Osos, um, part of the El Moro State Park, uh, com uh, the Moro Bay State Park Complex. This is a remarkable 90 acre property that uh, was uh, acquired through some really creative means and provides really incomparable habitat to about 200 species, uh, including the uh, species of pygmy oak, uh, as well as having what is over a mile long uh, boardwalk trail, a remarkable cultural interpretation of Chumash culture and Chumash cultural history on the land, uh, told from the perspective of a young Chumash girl. And it got my six-year-old, Kala right there, super interested in understanding the way that Native Americans lived on California's land. And we got, it was a, it was a great morning. And so it reminded me of why we do this work and the whole, focus of our cutting the green tape uh, effort is how can we create, restore, maintain more places like this across the 100 million acres of, of California land. So I'm going to stop that virtual background and I'm going to get you back to uh, where I'm at right now, which is 13 floors up in, in my office in Sacramento. And I think my goal for today, or what I've been asked to do is just set the the frame for today's discussion, sort of catch us up to where we're at in the cutting the green tape effort, uh, and then talk about some of the progress that we've made uh, since many of us were last uh, together. So let me start by providing a little bit of the origin story. And that is the members of the Landscape Stewardship Network uh, came into this office where I'm at right now, boy, almost about two years ago. And uh, at the time they included uh, even Armando Quintero, uh, who is now our, our state parks director, but certainly Sharon and Kellex and some of the other folks that have led this effort. And they talked to me about the role of the natural resources secretary as providing a significant opportunity to help make it easier and more cost-effective to restore this incredible environment in California. And they explained to me that uh, many of our well-meaning processes uh, in our agency and other agencies um, that were put in place a long time ago to really protect the environment, sometimes actually slow that environmental restoration work uh, that needs to take place. And the way that we either give out money or approve projects or provide resources for projects can actually make these projects more complicated. And so this got me really interested in what we can do uh, to, to deliver environmental restoration, environmental protect protection, uh, more cost effectively, quickly uh, across California. And for good reason, right? We face a climate crisis, California, the West, already experiencing the impacts of climate change, worsening catastrophic wildfire, more punishing drought and flooding, sea level rise, coastal erosion, extreme heat. And we know that in order to build the resilience of our natural places and our communities, there's a lot of work that we have to do. Likewise, to protect what is truly unique biodiversity on our planet here in California, 
there's a lot of work that we actually need to do, uh, restoring and maintaining uh, environmental habitat in these natural places. The challenge is we're in, a, we're in a race against time and anything that makes it harder to move from the status quo to environmental improvement uh, makes it more difficult to address these planetary crises of climate, the climate crisis and the nature crisis. So the question is, how can we be more effective and ultimately faster uh, on making environmental improvements across the state? And that's really where the cutting green tape moniker comes in. In essence, um, where can we cut the red tape to doing environmental work, making environmental improvements? And so that, that first meeting with the Landscape Stewardship Network was really the genesis of a process that played out over the last year and a half. Uh, many of us actually had the opportunity to be in a room together before the pandemic hit uh, uh, in these roundtable discussions around what are opportunities that practitioners can identify for us to cut green tape. Now, this work um, wasn't, uh, wasn't generated or we weren't, we weren't creating this from whole cloth. The significant efforts were underway both across government and outside of government uh, uh, on this priority. For example, the California uh, State Water Resources Control Board or the State Water Board under the leadership of Joaquin Esquivel have been working on some interesting uh, reform that you'll hear about today <clears throat> to make it easier to get this work done through water board permitting. Karen Ross and the Department of Food and Agriculture similarly passionate about how can we make it easier to do environmental conservation on working lands, including agriculturally productive lands. Um, cer you know, uh, certain entities within our agency, for example, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission uh, uh, was one of several, I think seven agencies that came together to create essentially a program called BRIT to more effectively deliver environmental permitting for, for San Francisco Bay wetlands restoration. So there was already a lot of work in place. Likewise, uh, external groups like Sustainable Conservation and others uh, we're actually leading an effort to identify solutions to cut the green tape. So building on all of these efforts across our state government, as well as outside of government, uh, beginning over, you know, over a year ago, we really developed this cutting green tape initiative. In other words, how can we put a rocket booster on this work? What are changes that we can make in our natural resources agency, across our state agencies, or even more broadly, uh, to help get this work done more quickly. And how can we learn from the people on the ground, that's including many of you here today, that actually are getting this work done and frankly, sometimes encounter these barriers that make that work more difficult to do. So that series of roundtables ultimately got interrupted by the beginning of the stay at home order last spring, but thanks to the Landscape Stewardship Network, we moved many of those input sessions online. And then come summer or fall, summer, late summer, early fall, the Landscape Stewardship Network with our blessing and strong encouragement delivered in essence a white paper, very specifically identifying what steps state agencies can take to cut the green tape. Now, during this time, we were also really excited at our agency to create the first ever Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat uh, to really drive this work and uh, more broadly work I'll talk about in just a moment. And we recruited into that position a woman named Jen Norris, who many of you know, a PhD biologist who had been helping to lead the Sacramento field office of the US Fish and Wildlife Services for, for, for 14 years. So we brought Jen into that role just as these recommendations were coalescing from the Landscape Stewardship Network and were able to celebrate and mark and help elevate the release of all of those recommendations. Uh, in uh, parallel to that, we had been working with Governor Newsom on something he was very interested in, which is uh, how do we elevate nature-based solutions uh, to our climate crisis and our priority to maintain biodiversity and build more equitable access to the outdoors in our state. And that culminated in an executive order from Governor Newsom this past October that really elevated the role nature-based solutions play in all of our environmental work and set the very clear target of conserving 30% of our land and coastal waters by 2030, the so-called 30 by 30 goal. 
And we were really gratified that fast forward a few months when President Biden, Vice President Harris uh, took leadership. Similarly, in their, in their very high profile climate directive, they established the 30 by 30 conservation goal as a national goal. Likewise, in that executive order, the governor called for a climate smart land strategy to really optimize our management of both natural and working lands uh, to build climate resilience and to help combat climate crisis by maximizing uh, carbon renewal, removal. Uh, and that executive order charged uh, food and agriculture, natural resources, Cal EPA, to all work together on 30 by 30 climate smart lands, agricultural solutions. So from my perspective, we're really riding a wave of momentum and political support from our governor, from our legislator, legislature, to do more to actually restore nature for all of these very important priorities. Later in the fall, actually right around the turn of uh, the, the year at the end of December, I was actually able to uh, issue a set of directives uh, using my power in the role of secretary uh, to entities within our agency to take some of the first uh, steps that were recommended in that Landscape Stewardship Network white paper. Uh, from last year. And likewise, the Department of Fish and Wildlife that has been driving um, on this topic for some time uh, has been able to actually continue accelerating uh, the reforms it's making within its permitting process and its funding processes uh, to, to cut the green tape. So the goal here is to really ensure that we're maintaining the momentum. Uh, success was not issuing the recommendations. Success is making these changes that have a demonstrable impact on helping environmental restoration come on line more quickly and cost effectively. So I like to think about this as a journey. And we took one important phase of the journey by getting all of this input, uh, supporting the, the issuance of these recommendations. Well, now we're in a different phase of the journey, which is implementing these recommendations and wayfinding around how we take those very good ideas and put them into practice. So. Again, very thankful uh, for our partners at Landscape Stewardship Network, for everybody in state agencies that continue to lead on this work. And it's our goal on behalf of Governor Newsom as principals uh, in our agencies to really support this process uh, and this effort, however possible. And with that, I wanted to invite my colleague, Karen Ross, who I think is uh, here today to provide any uh, uh, short opening comments that she would have uh, as we start to dive into the details of what we're accomplishing in real time. Hi, wait, I'm gonna jump in because I, I think- Did I just Karen, pull an audible on that one, Sean? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's all right. I think Karen had a commitment come up and then she's gonna join us right at two o'clock. So she'll be here in about four minutes. So we can either uh, move forward and invite her into the panel discussion, which might be a good way to Move, to include her voice moving forward, or if there's anything that you want to say in addition, we can simply wait for a couple more minutes. So, no, oh, I think it's a, I think it's a great idea to in integrate her into the panel. Awesome. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for that framing, Wade. It was a really good orientation into cutting green tape. If this is your first meeting, and for everyone else, me included, it was just a wonderful update on the inspiration behind this idea, how it how it took form in this report of recommendations, and how those recommendations are now moving forward in, into implementation. And then I, I love how this was framed as a journey because I think that is the opportunity that we have through these conversations is taking that journey together, thinking about how wonderful it is to have statewide leadership that can provide the stage and, and help direct and provide some um, vision for this leader or for cutting green tape. But then it's really up to all of us to see ourselves in this conversation and to walk that road together. And that wayfinding is, is where we currently are in this journey. And so we have the opportunity now to hear more from different leadership perspectives around the state and how they're taking steps forward in cutting green tape and how those are helping advance our work together towards those longer term objectives um, to, to really achieve the progress that we're looking for at the pace that's needed to be successful. So with that, I'm going to transition into a panel conversation that we're really framing as an exchange opportunity. These folks have generously offered to share a few insights with all of us to kick things off. And so here in a minute, we'll get a chance to hear from 
these folks. I'll just quickly introduce them to you now and then frame this panel up. So we're going to start with Jen Norris, who Wade introduced us to just a moment ago. She is now the Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat with California Natural Resources Agency. Then we'll move to Chad Dibble, who's the Deputy Director for Ecosystem Conservation the Ecosystem Conservation Division at CDFW. And then over to Paul Hahn, who's the Chief of Watersheds and Wetlands with State Water Resources Control Board. And then over to Erica Lovejoy, the Program Director for uh, Accelerating Restoration at Sustainable Conservation. And then Kellex Nelson will come forward, who's a board member with California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, as well as a steering committee member for the California Landscape Stewardship Network. And all of these people have been playing a real leadership role in cutting green tape, and I'm glad to have all of them with us here today. So the way this is going to play out here, and I think if, if Karen Ross is able to jump in, we're going to add her to this panel. We're going to invite each of these folks to just share with us a few high level updates on what they've been doing from their perspective and how they're seeing this work really in, really move forward in a way that helps them achieve their agency and organizational goals and does it in a way that's more efficient and effective than we've done in the past. So gonna just in a second here, I see Jen's on the screen, turn it over to her. From there, we're gonna engage in a little bit of conversation with the panelists. So really explore some of the dimensions of where they are in this journey of implementation, and then invite you guys to share your, your steps forward. What is it that you're seeing within your organization or agency or within your work that really lends a hand to this shared, this shared um, implementation effort? To do that, you can simply drop something in the chat box. So maybe it's a quick update, maybe it's a link to a newsletter or a document or a URL. Maybe it's an opportunity to actually join the conversation. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you can, I think there's a raise the hand function, or maybe you can just put a, a note in the chat box that, hey, I've got a quick one to two minute update that I'd actually like to share in real time with this group and engage in conversation. So we're gonna invite all of those different pieces of the story forward and really demonstrate in real time how much work is actually going in to implementing cutting green tape. So with that, I'm gonna just start at the top of the list here and Jen, turn it over to you. Thanks so much. And uh, <clears throat> thanks everyone for joining us. I, uh, it's hard to go after Wade because he says all the great and important things up front and then you just sound like you're repeating them. So I won't, but thank you for the nice introduction, Secretary Crowfoot. I am Jennifer Norris, uh, Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat. I lead up our Cutting Green Tape initiative, as well as 30 by 30, which was mentioned. Um, so I'm, I was asked to reflect on my role in this effort. And um, I was thinking about how what I do is part cheerleader, part uh, listener or therapist, and part problem solver. I do spend a lot of time engaging in conversations with all kinds of folks around the state about cutting green tape. There's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm around this initiative. Um, and it's really brought to the surface a lot of opportunities for us to do better. So I, um, I talk with our external partners and I find out what's working and I find out what's not working. Um, I work with our internal departments and conservancies on how they're working to advance cutting green tape, um, their progress and challenges. We do a lot of problem solving together. A lot of my work is really behind the scenes, but um, I like to see it as um, being helpful if I can. And I, I want to point out that, you know, Wade touched on how important cutting green tape is to our larger um, conservation initiatives. And I would just echo that and say that this is a really important initiative to me. Um, you know, restoration and land stewardship, they're essential to our biodiversity and conservation goals and, and to addressing climate change. You know, we cannot preserve ourselves out of the crisis we're in. You know, there aren't enough pristine landscapes out there. We really need to roll up our sleeves and pick up our shovels and get to work. And um, we've got to figure out how to do that faster um, and more effectively. And for those of you that know me and have worked with me in the past, you also know that I've really made a career out of um, trying to make environmental policies and regulations work as intended. You know, if we want there to be support for these rules, we actually have to show that they function. And so, um, and I don't think any of these rules are written to keep restoration from happening. So we've got to find a way to be more effective and work together. Um, 
I was also asked to reflect on just how practitioners and all of you maybe can support CNRA in our work. And to get a little more granular, I think about a big restoration project. I recently had the opportunity to go to um, visit one down in the Delta and I won't name names, but the story was it took 20 years to get the permit. And we were talking on our tour about sort of what, what caused that 20 year delay and it was the same answer that you always get. It's a series of little decisions, right? No one permit is one decision. It's multiple, multiple decisions over time, how to fund, what the scope of work is, what can be, what can be funded, all the different decisions about the different regulatory requirements along the way. And each of those decisions, when they get delayed, they compound and that can lead to a 20 year holdup in getting something really important done. And so I was thinking about as we work together on these projects, how important it is to really keep your purpose in mind. What are we trying to get done? We're trying to get restoration done. And which of these little decisions, you know, do we really need to spend a lot of time on? And which ones can we move on? You know, what is the hill you want to die on? You know, there are some, there are some issues that you really need to grapple with and we should save our time and our energy for those. And for the others, we should really try, do our best to move on because it's easy to get wrapped around the axle even about some things that are small. And the other thing I would say is that I think we should recognize um, that at the end of the day, all of our conservation problems are really people problems, right? And to solve them, we need to build relationships and work together. And I think to do that most effectively in this space, we should always return to the understanding that we're all in this, all of us, I'm sure on this call, because we care about the natural world and we're all committed to doing good. And, and getting biodiversity conserved, returning to functional ecosystems, that's why we dedicated our lives to these things. And so um, I think if we all can always come into the conversations and build those relationships around that common purpose, take the time to get to know people and work with them one-on-one, -on -one, because sometimes you're gonna be working with them for 20 years to get that permit done, hopefully not, but it could happen. So um, I would just encourage us always to come into these dialogues with an open heart and really try to listen and build common ground because that investment is gonna pay off down the line. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Chad who is one of those people who's building relationships and doing some really great work. Chad, your turn. Thank you, uh, Jen. And thank you to all of you really for being here today. I, I'm, I'm just so appreciative of all of your effort and, and participation so far. My name is Chad Dibble. I am the Deputy Director of the Ecosystem Conservation Division at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I am really excited to be here today to, to continue the dialogue that we've been having with so many of you over the last two years. As a quick update for us uh, on this side of things that are happening from our side anyway, um, most of you know the department received one-time funding for this fiscal year to analyze and develop improvements to our restoration granting and permitting programs. I was directed to lead this effort in the department, which really started with us um, working quickly to identify and redirect about 19 staff uh, to work on a dozen or so initiatives, some of them existing, some of them new, et cetera. Um, so for the first couple of months, we were really centered around getting organized and identifying what our cutting the green tape initiative should be. And where we settled was on efforts such as developing a focused PSN, re-engaging uh, the Restoration Leaders Committee, developing a Prop 1 five-year report, looking at ways to accelerate existing grants, um, to keep them on track or you know, close them out, make sure that they, they actually get done. Uh, we, we started developing new tools for permitting projects, we're working with the water board on the restoration general order. And, and we really focused some efforts on accelerating the development of regional conservation and stra investment strategies to push some of those projects along you know, over the last little hurdles that they seem to be stuck on and get them finalized. And I'm really impressed and I'm really proud of the progress we've made since last summer. A couple of key examples for us include, again, reconvening the stakeholders uh, through the Restoration Leaders Committee. And there we're really actively looking back at the 18 recommendations that they provided to us uh, some time ago to improve our granting processes. And through that, we've began to implement several grant improvements over the last year. And while some of this is a little bit of insider trading on the things and the ways the department operates, I think it shows the spirit of what the department is trying to do both internally and external, externally through this initiative. We've been able to consolidate signature authority of our grants. 
And again, this is insider trading, but for those that don't know, uh, previously, for us to implement a grant, it touched several hands within the department, a branch in budgets and a branch in contracts and a branch in, in granting and a branch in legal, et cetera. We've now created a one-stop shop uh, for our bond program in the grants branch, where we administer the grants end to end within that branch. And that really shaved off a lot of time that we frankly wasted in trying to just get a grant out the door. We're revising our amendment guidance. We're revising our, flexi our budget flexibility to really try and think about how we can put a, a, an end to some of these endless amendments that we go through, because we know that projects, as they move along, things happen. And we need to provide flexibility so that we don't have to do a formal amendment every single time we need to move a line item from A to B. So we're really working on some of those things. We're also, uh, we started a dialogue with agency to revise grant guidelines, to take those additional steps or bold steps that will allow us to properly balance our bond oversight with adaptive support for some of these really large, complex, you know, large scale projects. We're trying to make it easier to apply. We're trying to make it easier to fund existing projects. Again, sometimes we fund a project, we get down the road and we find out that that project needs to turn. It needs to go right, left. And it might need some additional funding to actually make it better or to enhance the restoration project itself. So we're looking at ways to get creative of staying within the bond language, but allowing us to adaptively maybe even provide more funding for that project because it's the right thing to do and it's what needs to happen. We've also spent a lot of time working on the permitting side. We have started a pilot project within the department to really provide more coordination in our granting and our permitting staff. We, we've never done this before. It sounds silly, but we're really more coordinated with working together with our own staff from one program to the other. Somebody who does grants and somebody who does permits. Now we're talking, we're meeting, and we're working forward to accelerate those projects and make sure that everybody understands what we're trying to do and how we're moving together. We're exploring all sorts of new permitting options, which we covered heavily at our workshops uh, about a month ago, including the programmatic permitting stuff that people have been asking us about for projects outside of FRGP. We're making some headway there. There's lots to do, but we're making headway. We've been working closely with the Water Board, with NOAA, you know, our state and federal partners, which is absolutely critical to the success of this program and us moving forward. And we continue those conversations and are thankful that they're willing to play along. Over the next several months, and as we close out this fiscal year, um, we'll be working to finalize all these things, right? All these initiatives that we just talked about in these workshops. Um, and, and it's really gonna provide us that proof of concept. And the hope is that we'll better identify which of these granting and permitting tools that we've been developing over the course of the year should go forward, right? Really, which ones are the ones that we wanna move through and continue in the into the future? And, and can we expand it and how fast? And how do we do that? And how do we implement it? And lastly, later this summer, you'll see that we will actually hold our North Coast grant solicitation, which will focus the $15 million that we set aside for coho recovery and the North Coast Salmon Project watersheds. And that really is where the rubber hits the road for us. That's where we will have our test case to take all of these granting and permitting tools from the beginning of the process and be able to apply them to a set of grants and projects going forward. And we really hope that you know, that's where we'll begin to learn and working with you, you'll start to see the things we've done and we'll actually be implementing. Of course, we're gonna learn, of course, we're gonna change, expand, do all of those things, but we're really looking forward to moving to that next click of where we go. So that's what's in front of us, that's what's happening. That's my quick intro. I'll yield my time back to the panel and just know that, um, of course, I'm here to answer questions that you might have and, and just really thankful for all of you and, and the, the, the participation you provided, the comments, the feedback, the surveys you've, you've filled out and, and just been a part of this with us as we continue to move forward. So thank you for that. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Chad, for that introduction and update to everything that's happening within the department. And I love that framing of what can we do within CDFW to help advance these goals and think systematically across your different program areas, grants, introducing new tools, all of that. So really, really good. I did see that Secretary Ross was able to jump on and I know she's got a limited amount of time with us. So I'd like to turn to her next and, and then we'll go back to you, Paul. So Secretary Ross, would you like to share a few words? Sure, and I apologize for being late. Um, we had our State Board of Food and Agriculture meeting today, and we did everything from drought to climate and all of our climate goals 
to sustainable pest management and all the changes coming at us, but there was one theme across all of it, and it is the critical importance from an agricultural perspective that we're approaching everything as a, as a system and, and integrated solutions. And that's what I'm hearing and that's what the real opportunity is here. I'm not gonna talk in specifics. Um, I'm gonna talk at a higher level, but uh, it may not be a surprise that there are a lot of people who are completely disenfranchised with government these days. And even when we set out to do good, like restoration, and then people see that it's going on and on and on and they're still not seeing the results, it becomes discouraging. It becomes discouraging to landowners who are intrigued and would like to be a part of a project, but then they look at the bureaucracy of it and they're like, why would I get caught up in that? I'm just trying to make the farm work, but I'd really like to do something with this river restoration or doing something for this species. And so at the end of the day, what I'm hearing is this remarkable opportunity that we have on something that is so critical in a changing climate and our need for resiliency and our commitment to biodiversity and meet the 30 by 30 goals is that if we can operate in these very closely integrated, collaborative, true partnerships, we will show people results. And by showing results and showing them faster, we will get the opportunity to do more projects. There will be more funding and we'll have more people wanting to step into it because we've simplified the process and not made it so intimidating. And that for me, is one of the reasons I was so thrilled that Secretary Crowfoot wanted to undertake this, um, that cutting green tape really can mean something that translates into meaningful work on the land. And that um, you're exactly right, Jen, it's about people and building these relationships. And what I heard Chad talk about is the importance of building our relationships across government, even within our own agencies, let alone our sister agencies, and I think that's one thing that climate and the urgency of the climate crisis is really causing us, forcing us, inviting us to really look across who all can be a part of the solution set. And so this approach, I believe, is going to have tremendous, tremendous payoffs. And, and you know, future generations may not know what we did, but we, we, can, we can do our work knowing that we are touching future generations future generations and the many people that will never know it, but we know what the worth of it is. So I just wanted to keep it at a very big picture like that. But for me, it's really, it's making it even more attractive for farmers and landowners who would like to do this work and get completely intimidated about it, that this really opens up the opportunity for more acres, more collaborators, more projects getting done with or without public funding. I think at the end of the day, that would help too. So. That's all I needed to say, but thank you. And I really apologize for being late. Hey, no worries at all. We are so glad to have your voice in the room with us today. And the way that you framed that is really a systems level opportunity, but the focus, the purpose is really to help that on the ground landowner or that practitioner. And so we need to think across all of those different scales. And you just painted a beautiful picture of how we can think about that and how it can help us achieve these, these outcomes that we're looking toward, the, the purpose-driven work, but in a way that's really focused to our, our passions to connect back to Jen's openings remarks that so many of us get into this work because of the resource, because of the opportunity to really make a difference on the ground and in our communities. And this is how we can do it. We can do it by working together to meet the opportunity of, of this time and to do it in a way that's timely enough to meet some of the urgent challenges that we're facing. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back um, over to Paul. So Paul, you wanna jump in? Oh, you're on mute, Paul. Of course I'm on mute. There you go, perfect. <laughs> I'm Paul Han. I'm the section chief for the watersheds and wetlands section within the State Water Resources Control Board. There's two primary program areas that, that I oversee that both relate to this cutting the green tape initiative. Um, one of which is our 401 certification process. And of course that's at, that, uh, at the heart of a lot of the recommendations that came out of this group. Um, I also oversee our 319 grant program. That's a grant program that comes out of the federal government to pay for non-point source, uh, uh, non source control activities, many of which are restoration activities. So from my perspective, I'm not only a permittee, but I'm, I'm not a permit writer, but I, in many cases, I have projects that are the permittee. So I get to see kind of both sides of this picture. Um, when we were doing our dredger fill procedures uh, 
couple of years back, one of the things that came up was a recognition that, hey, we really wanted to make sure that we uh, cleared the path for restoration activities. And so we built a few things into our procedures that addressed um, voluntary restoration activities. But we knew that there were some activities out there that didn't really fall under the voluntary um, umbrella or might be a little larger than what we were thinking of. You know, a couple of things that come to mind is the Fisheries Restoration Grant Program for CDFW and uh, the uh, Department of Water Resources Eco Restore programs. Both of those were kind of square pegs in a round hole for our policy. And so one of the things that we thought is, hey, it's probably best for us to look at those through the lens of a permit as opposed to trying to figure out how to twist this policy around these projects. And it was about that same time that Erica, who will be speaking shortly, came to us from Sustainable Conservation and said, hey, we've got this crazy idea about this permit that we'd like to, to work with you guys on. And it was, it was perfect timing because frankly, we, we had a policy issue that we needed to resolve. Um, Erica had some, some ideas about how to address a, a, um, uh, some of the permit aspects that we thought would be were, were right in line with what we were thinking about. And so it, it, it really was just perfect timing. And so that's one of the things that we've been working with sustainable conservation on is this development of a statewide restoration general order, which is, uh, I think, recommendation six in the, in the, uh, in the list of recommendations. Um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to get that out this spring or this summer for public review, um, perhaps adoption, consideration of adoption as early as the fall. Um, so that's underway. We're looking to be, maybe we can be the, one of the first people to check off a box on that, on that uh, cutting the green tape initiative. Um, we're also working on updates to the small habitat restoration permit. And again, that's something that comes up frequently in the, in the cutting the green tape report. Um, we are looking at that question of whether or not we should be uh, harmonizing some of our, our requirements to meet that class 33 CEQA size. That's something we're actively in discussions about internally. Um, we're also doing some preliminary work on development of an online application uh, system. So these are the kind of things that we're working on right now. Um, you know, ultimately what we hope comes out of this is, you know, obviously an increased pace and scale of restoration activities, but there's also a net benefit to us as an agency because this allows us to divert work, uh, divert resources from work that frankly is high effort and low risk, you know, high effort, low risk projects um, and divert those resources to areas where they'd be better used and, and, and of more, utility. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the, the work that we're doing now. Um, you know, when we talk about coordination, we are doing a lot of coordination with CDFW. There's a lot more need for coordination between our agencies and we're looking forward to, to engaging on that more. Um, we've also had some interesting conversations with Caltrans over their um, statewide advanced mitigation initiative. So Caltrans, through Prop 1, um, got a, a ton of money to work on on restoration and, and mitigation work. And that's something that we've been partnering with them to try and figure out, okay, how do we best, uh, how do we work with Caltrans to make sure that they're correctly identifying your impacts? And what can we do as an agency to figure out, okay, where should we be looking at restoration priorities for the state? And that's something that I see as a, as a real critical need for our organization moving forward is, is really some of this higher level, hey, where are the priorities type of work that, uh, that, that needs to happen? And I know there's a lot of different groups that have done that kind of prioritization setting work. Um, it, I would love to see us you know, work on that more as a, as a uni, unified uh, set of agencies. So um, that's, that's who I am and what I'm thinking about. Fantastic, Paul. Thanks so much. And I, I love that call to action in terms of setting priorities and how do we think about how we do that within our organizations and then together as a group of people who have this shared interest in doing the work in a more effective, efficient way. Just want to thank everyone online who's, a, who's joining us as an attendee today for the questions that are coming in and for our panelists. Hopefully you're, hopefully you're seeing those too uh, in the chat box and in the Q&A box. Some, some really good things that revisit some of the recommendations that came forward in the report, and then some, some new things that are coming up just in the discussion. Would like to invite all of you to continue to share those, whether they're questions or comments or thoughts or updates on things that you're seeing as they connect to Cutting Green Tape. Re really good to see that. 
come through here. And just so people know, we'll get to some of those during this panel discussion and those that we can't get to in the time we allot, we've allotted for today, we'll, we'll take some time afterward and get back to everyone here as soon as we can. So just, just in the interest of moving forward, I'm gonna invite Erica to share a few thoughts with us now. So Erica. Uh, hi, everybody. Really great to be here today. Thank you very much. I'm Erica Lovejoy with the Sustainable Conservation. I'm the director of our Accelerating Restoration Program. And for those of you who don't know uh, our organization, we are a statewide environmental nonprofit that works to solve some of the toughest challenges around our land and water in California. And we have been involved in uh, removing barriers to restoration at many different levels, including working on policy and regulatory tools to incentivize restoration and also development of efficient permitting mechanisms like programmatic permits like Paul had mentioned earlier. And so just to be clear, as I talk about them a little bit more, programmatic permits are permits that are written in advance for commonly done project types. And that's where all the rules and essential conditions to protect the environment are written up front. And this means that there can be a lot of time and money saved. These permits create more regulatory certainty. And then they also allow agency staff more time to partner with project proponents and provide technical assistance. And so for the last several years, uh, we've been working with many of the different agencies to develop statewide restoration authorizations, either administratively or through legislation. So just some of the highlights here, we helped NOAA Restoration Center with some of their programmatic authorizations, their programmatic biological opinions, they call them. And then we also helped NOAA acquire consistency determinations from the California Coastal Commission. On the legislative side, we sponsored the Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Act back in 2014. This is mentioned uh, in the Cutting the Green Tape Recommendations, the act. And that creates a highly expedited process uh, for California Department of Fish and Wildlife for small scale projects. And uh, that's been a very successful program. And so jump into what's going on right now, because I know folks want to know uh, about progress. Um, we are building off of our prior work uh, with the NOAA Restoration Center and the Coastal Commission, and we are working on two more statewide authorizations for projects in aquatic habitat. And uh, you know, we uh, came up with a, pro a set of project types based on surveys from restoration project proponents, from funders, from agency scientists, you know, looking at the priorities for the next 20, 10 to 20 years. And so the, one of the first things we're doing is we are helping the US Fish and Wildlife Service to develop a statewide authorization or what they call a programmatic biological opinion to cover permitting for federally listed species that are commonly encountered with aquatic habitat restoration projects. And uh, the NOAA Restoration Center and the Army Corps of Engineers are also involved in that process uh, because they have um, legally related uh, permitting processes. And then in parallel, as Paul touched upon, uh, we are partnering with the State Water Board uh, to develop a their statewide uh, restoration general order and also a programmatic environmental impact report uh, that's, that's gonna cover the same set of project types and contains coordinated uh, environmental protection measures or conditions uh, with the US Fish and Wildlife Service authorization I just mentioned and the existing NOAA BOs. So by having all of these coordinated elements, we are hoping that that will speed things up later on down the line when project proponents uh, take advantage of these permits. And I will add that um, uh, uh, Chad and his, and his uh, colleagues at CDFW provided some very helpful input on uh, aspects of some of the initial documents for the Fish and Wildlife Service and also on the programmatic environmental impact report. Uh, for the water board. And so the idea is that, you know, we're trying to look at common conditions amongst the agencies uh, to help make it easier for them. And then hopefully DFW will be able to really take advantage of that programmatic environmental impact report as well. So once all of these permits are in place, sustainable conservation will continue to try and support uh, both the agencies and project proponents to take advantage of these new tools through our existing technical assistance program, we, we provide a lot of technical assistance on how to use these new permitting uh, mechanisms. And we are also developing a new dedicated website that's gonna help applicants to uh, figure out, okay, what are the new programmatic permits out there? How do I qualify? What do I need to do and take advantage of them? 
I want to uh, just remind everybody, of course, Paul said that, you know, we hope that the state water board draft permit and CEQA document will be out for review in the next couple of months. And we definitely hope that you all take the opportunity to uh, comment on that document and provide your support for the progressive work that the state board is doing. It's really important uh, work. And then the next thing I wanted to let you know about in terms of updates that's also in the cutting the green tape recommendations is that we have been working on Senate Bill 716 uh, with Senator Mike McGuire's office. And that is for reauthorization of the Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Act. So that program sunsets at the end of this year. And if we don't get it renewed, you know, folks won't be able to take advantage of that. So we're moving forward, uh, trying to support that bill. And there's been a lot of interest in it. We know a lot of folks would like to see various changes to the act, uh, but we are, uh, our goal at Sustainable Conservation is really just to, to seek reauthorization and extend the sunset so we don't have any risk to that particular program, which is very, very popular and, uh, and very useful for project proponents. There's a number of other cutting the green tape recommendations that we have been involved with over the years, uh, revolving around CEQA and work with some of the agencies like the Department of Fish and Wildlife and others. And we are going to continue to offer uh, uh, the agencies, uh, DFW, the resources agencies, uh, all involved, uh, any assistance we can to help move those efforts forward. And you know, just like everybody here in the room, our goal is, is really to put restoration on a separate permitting track than development, okay? So, so we can help steward these projects through the regulatory process and make them a priority for the agencies. So that, that's what we're trying to do. And we're looking forward to uh, collaborating with everybody over the next uh, year or two and more, because I think this is really gonna be an iterative process with all the things that need to come into place. But um, I'm, I'm very encouraged by this effort and I know we can make it happen. Thank you. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Erica. Lots of fantastic updates there and really starting to see how this panel is an exchange of everything that's happening across the landscape from all these different perspectives. So from the administrative and legislative actions that you talked about to the communications and coordination work and really helping people plug into this work from a whole bunch of different perspectives, that's, that's fantastic to hear. Just a, a quick programming update. It sounds like a couple of things for best practices here for submitting questions so that people can see them. If you're submitting a question into the chat, if you wouldn't mind hitting the little down button next to the two button to make sure that it's going to panelists and attendees so that everyone can see those questions as they come in. I think we can all benefit from seeing what other people are thinking about and talking about and asking questions about. And the same thing for our administrators in the back end there. It looked like maybe the default settings where the Q&A were set just so the panelists could see those questions. If we could change that, not sure we can do that in real time, but if possible to make those Q and A um, questions come in so that everyone can see and benefit from people's shared interest and understanding, that'd be great. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kellex. Kellex, go ahead. Thanks, Sean. So as, uh, as Sharon mentioned in her introduction, in uh, 2016, the California Landscape Stewardship Network started coming together to address large pressing challenges that require that we work together in new ways. One of our first priorities was to reduce the regulatory barriers to restoration and stewardship of our lands. By spring of 2019, we published a white paper that reviewed and assessed some of the significant efforts to date to reduce regulatory barriers to restoration. That paper and almost everything that we're referencing today that came through or involved the Landscape Stewardship Network is on the, the network's website. That, that 2019 white paper posed the idea of shifting our risk paradigm, that we've entered a new era in which delayed action or insufficient action is a more significant risk potentially than the risk of unintended consequences of doing restoration. And to Erica's point that permitting uh, restoration it needs to be different from permitting projects that are, are you know, pure development. So by that fall, we found ourselves sitting in Secretary Crowfoot's office, the meeting that he referenced in his introduction. And we worked with him and then were joined by that following spring with Deputy Secretary Norris. And within a year, this past November, we published this report 
that was the result of a series of roundtables and phone interviews with over 150 people from nonprofits, restoration practitioners, advocacy groups, public and private land managers, local, state, and federal government agencies, tribes, water utilities, working lands, businesses, you name it. The results was the paper that many of you, uh, and, and I can't see you, but many of you have read or, or participated in crafting. And there are 14 recommendations that are at, in, are at intentionally different scales. Some are calling for a clarification or for incremental improvements, others for broader systems changes, some that could be implemented right away, others that require additional groundwork um, with a range of potential implementing entities. Many of these recommendations build on or support other efforts that you've heard about on this panel and I want to express my gratitude to folks on this panel who have been working on those, and I've been a fan of sustainable conservation in particular for many years now. The paper that we uh, published in November provides one well vetted set of options that offer a path forward. It's a particular uh, sort of snapshot in time of the conversation that was had to date. And that as well as a series of webinars. I saw, um, Sean, in the polls that you had in the beginning, I saw that there were a number of folks uh, who are new to this conversation. And so for those of you who are in this meeting to get a sense of what Cutting Green Tape is, you might also benefit from some of the webinars that focused more on that, on introducing the initiative and what it is and what the recommendations are. So by all means, check out those. Uh, there's a, a variety of webinars online right now that you might wanna check out as well. We recognize, well, what the California Stewardship Network did is we um, helped, we partnered with the resources agency and provided some support to facilitate and create the conditions and for people to have good conversation to make these recommendations. Implementing these recommendations is going to require a lot of partnership, a lot of people with different authorities, missions and mandates working toward a vision of getting restoration done. And I think that's part of it is it's shifting the vision. The vision is while, while there are still essential statutes that, um, that oh, in se essential environmental protections, are we looking at our work through a lens of applying statute or are we looking through the lens from a perspective of getting essential work done? Kind of like um, Deputy Secretary Norris was saying in her comments, you know, which, which hill do you wanna die on here? And so I was, I was thrilled that Resources Agency already implemented the first recommendation in the report. And um, Secretary Crowfoot did that, and he issued a memo about uh, the next steps for the other recommendations, for all the recommendations that fall with, within Resource Agency's authority. I was also thrilled that on October 7th of this past year, the 30 by 30 executive orders specifically referenced uh, regulatory um, efficiencies so that basically states investments in restoration can be effective and efficient. And um, there are partners across the state that are advancing innovations and solutions, whether they're legislative or programmatic, some of them on this panel, many of them um, in the uh, as participants or attendees today. We've also been coordinating with some partners who are thinking about or might propose legislation. One of the things that we're particularly interested in is helping um, ensure that folks are are rowing in the same direction on uh, legislation and to help ensure that proposed legislation is consistent with what we heard during the roundtables with what the recommendations are. I, I feel like I got a crash course in understanding um, the relationship between culture and legislation, that there was a lot when we went back and actually read the, the laws that they may or may not be uh, being implemented as intended. So I think a lot of what um, the network can do is, is help to hold the, the conversation around culture and um, whether we're, we're, we're sharing the same intentions about making this work easier um, and, and keeping, that, um, keeping that spirit and intent throughout the, the efforts that are going on. Um, and we're also really particularly keenly interested in learning from um, what people are doing and um, case studies. Uh, for example, um, what can we learn from some of the new significant interagency efforts that are moving forward? Um, do they result in projects getting done faster and more cost effectively? Are we measuring that? Can we measure that? How could we? Um, what are the different ways collaboration can work? Um, and then also, um, 
Chad Dibble talked about some work that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has been doing on that's essentially cutting green tape regarding funding, their funding programs, making improvements to their funding programs. And the California Landscape Stewardship Network is also intending for future phases of cutting green tape to tackle other authority issues and develop recommendations for things like data sharing and access, funding efficiencies, cross-jurisdictional collaboration, et cetera. And I wanna put a, a plug out for all of you that we're interested in hearing from you who are working in, in your myriad ways on cutting green tape. This really takes a village. And, um, and what are you bringing to the equation? What do you wanna to bring to the equation? What needs do you have? How's it working for you as we continue to, to learn and to help others uh, continue their learning? So I will go ahead and put my email in the, in the chat box and um, then folks can feel free to contact me directly. And um, I also recommend as a resource, if it's not already in the chat box, I've been speaking, so I, don't, I didn't see it. The, um, the page, Sustainable Conservation has a web page that guides people to the various tools that exist, many of which Sustainable Conservation created or helped to create. So um, I'll wrap up, because um, I, I know we want to get to conversation and Q&A with folks. And I want to express extreme gratitude. It's been a real pleasure working with Deputy Secretary Norris on this work and extreme gratitude to Secretary Crowfoot for enabling this to happen. We sat in his office in that fall and he said, I hear about this, what do you want me to do about it? And we said, we want you to do these things and boom, we're off like a rocket. And so I am very hopeful and we've already seen some change. I'm hopeful that we'll see more because as I've also heard Secretary Crowfoot say on climate change, winning slowly is actually losing. So we need to be working in different ways. So thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Gellix. And you're so humble about your role in all of this, but you've really fostered the space for a lot of this to happen and, and to bring those ideas forward to leadership and to catalyze new conversations and to bring new partnerships and voices together so that we can address some of these critical challenges. So thank you for the role that you're playing. Just looking at the, the clock here, we've got um, just a few more, we've got probably 15 minutes that we can get to some questions here. So I'm going to jump right into some of the questions from our, our audience here. And also thank those of you that are jumping into the chat box with some responses to some of the questions. So some of you guys actually in the audience hold answers to some of these questions. So thank you for providing those as well as some of the resources and links and other questions and concerns that you're bringing forward there. Please continue to do that in the chat box as we move forward. But want to start with a question from Carrie, and I'm going to get your name wrong, but I'm going to try it anyway, Luca Chick. Um, can someone discuss the interactions between CDFW and the Coastal Commission for restoration projects in the coastal zone? Someone? I don't know who can take that. I, I don't know. I'm going to look maybe to the CDFW guy. <laughs> uh, so there's two, kind of two parts to this. And I'm actually interested in understanding maybe some of the frustrations or things that you're seeing, but really it's about collaboration right so i'm assuming that there's projects there and you've got to get permitting from both of us not unlike any other uh effort we have between the water board or a federal agency or what have you so there's probably some for some frustrations there uh we do work with them obviously i think this comes back to the theme of what we're trying to do here which is how do we do better to coordinate together and whether that's led by the project applicant or whether that's led by an agency that has to take on the permitting and knows we're going to be interacting with all of these other parties and leading that effort to, to start that conversation earlier, figure out uh, what the needs are for all of the parties and really help uh, advance that project. Because I see this all the time, right? That's why we're here. Not only do we typically have problems within one agency or another, or even as a question I think alluded to later on about how do we even coordinate internally within our own agency when you go from one region to another or one you know, subset to another. So I know there's some frustrations there. We work with those parties and my advice would be if you have specific projects to come reach out to me or to one of our parties at the regional office and figure out how best to, to coordinate better on where we are. The CD thing is interesting. Um, however, you know, CDs under CISA for us uh, consistency determinations, those are more of a federal take permit, and then you're getting state authorization for those projects. So that's an interesting dynamic of a, a consistency determination between us and the Coastal Commission, if I read that question right, uh, that, that I don't think we have the abilities to do. So, so right now, it would still be set up as independent 
uh, authorizations from Coastal Commission and the department. And it really comes down to that coordination and working better on the project. And um, I'm interested in, in having very similar conversations with the Coastal Commission as we're having here. Uh, I think it's a great point that they are somewhat missing from this conversation, at least today. And we should probably think about how to do that better as this panel, uh, because they're a player, a major player, and us moving forward with all these different efforts. So uh, I'll take that home for us and, and, and back into my counterparts and working with Coastal Commission folks and figure out kind of where they're at in this, in this conversation and, and how we might be able to foster that conversation a little better. Yeah, I wanted to add, they actually are here. So, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so Jack Ainsworth and Madeline Cavallari are here. And I asked them actually, when we get to the next part of our agenda, if they would speak to exactly this issue. So they were going to take a couple minutes and do that. Great. Um, thank you. <laughs> and, then, um, and then, sorry, Chad, that we didn't have a chance to coordinate about that. And then, um, and then Darren, um, Darren Miro mentioned that that um, that maybe the person who asked that question was talking about coastal development permits, but actually, Darren, I think there is there has been conversations about something akin to a consistency determination like tool to be used uh, between state agencies for coastal development permits. Yeah, and while we're on that topic, I wonder if those folks are available to come forward now. It'd be great to just bring their voices forward as we're on this topic instead of coming back. So. Looks gonna, like Madeline was get put her put a comment in the chat. Maybe if she's willing to get on screen, we'd love to hear from you, Madeline. You're doing good stuff. I'm here as well, Jack Ainsworth. Oh, and and Jack. <laughs> yeah, Jack. I didn't mean so, to yeah, slight I'm you. Dead. I'm dead. <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> I'm always slight. That's cool. Uh, yeah, no. Oh, these man. are um, <laughs> these are uh, we are exploring various um, programmatic permitting approaches to the Cutting Green Tape Initiative. Um, similar to what we've, we were doing with the NOAA Restoration Center um, on federal um, restoration projects. We have a little more flexibility with, statutorily through our federal consistency um, um, process than we do through the Coastal Act, but taking those concepts and applying them to you know, coordination with Fish and Wildlife, for example, is something that we are looking at and looking also at master permits too, or programmatic permits, master permits that would cover uh, uh, a restoration programs on a larger scale regionally is another idea we're, we're kicking around. It's a little more difficult under the Coastal Act. Um, we have certain statutory requirements we have to deal with. I'm also uh, always concerned about um, making sure that um, we're, we're doing things that are um, they're going to withstand legal challenge because um, that is a, a concern we're seeing a much more litigious society right now and we're sued quite often over these types of things so it, it but it these are all um, approaches that we are, are pursuing fantastic well thank you so much for jumping in and sharing that directly with us it's great to have you be here with the panel and, and just to jump in on the fly madeline were you able to Jump in as well. Did you want to share a couple of words? I think, I think Jack covered it for us. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you both for being here. And and always nice to just hear it directly from you and, and your perspective and everything that you're doing to advance the, the same effort, the same outcomes, the same goals from your perspective on the commission. So glad we could connect those dots. I'm going to return to some of the questions coming in from our our audience now. And it, but kind of a, a broad question here um, from Ashley. Does cutting green tape seek to include mitigation under the broader umbrella of restoration? And from her experience, mitigation is often excluded from a lot of programs and initiatives, but could significantly benefit from the goals of cutting green tape. So someone want to address that, that perspective of how mitigation fits within cutting green tape? can speak to the fact that there's one recommendation that specifically addresses that. So there's one recommendation that says that um, that some of the efficiencies that exist basically should be agnostic of funding source. So if it's restoration, it's moving the dial to make make things better, um, uh, that that it, it should be eligible um, for some of these um, you know, efficient permitting tools that came out of some conversations are about, you know, some people had applied to 
grant programs through a conservancy. And it turns out that if you went all the way back, the funding that the conservancy had received was from a mitigation source, but it was, you know, restoration practitioners that were um, applying to do the work for priority projects. So that conversation definitely did come up. This is one of the ones that I think needs up there. There's where I have seen a lot more concern with people reacting to concerns that um, they don't want some of the um, abuse essentially of cutting green tape, something that opens the door to things that are environmentally degrading. But I can I can stop and see if anybody else, Jen, this is something you usually speak to pretty well. Did you have thoughts about this? I think it would definitely benefit from more conversation. I think I've said in a couple of different forums that in my mind, you know, mitigation is restoration we're doing now, <laughs> as opposed to 20 years from now when the, you know, it's separated from the impact. I think there are questions around, you know, how we, I mean, all of this permit streamlining is interrelated with lots of other things. One of which Chad has pointed out to me, you know, comes into whether a fee is paid to get the permit or, you know, who, where the resources are to fund the staff. And so the, it's all interrelated into a much more complicated question. But from my point of view, restoration is restoration, whether it's attached to an immediate impact or it's separated in time. Um, and I think it's, it's really worth us taking a broad expansive view of, of getting as much restoration done as we can. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys. So just looking at one of these questions, that's a little bit more focused on the how, how we work together in coordination. Um, question from Clayton, will cutting green tape include recommendations and actions that encourage organizations, agencies, and tribes to work together in a coordinated manner at the watershed level? In a couple of examples, this could include working together in a step-by-step -step basis to identify priorities, develop plans, jointly fund and implement coordinated actions. Is that part of the, the vision for cutting green tape in terms of implementation? How do we move forward? Does anyone want to jump in well, on that one? I'll jump in there because we're pushing hard on our on our wetland program, the idea of watershed planning. Um, I, I think it's unrealistic to think that an agency is necessarily going to do the watershed planning, at least a statewide agency. But I do think what, what's impaired upon, imperative upon the agencies is to make sure that they have programs in place that reward those groups and entities that are doing watershed scale planning. That's one of the things that we've built into our procedures is, is some regulatory relief for those programs where they're part of a larger uh, restoration effort. Um, certainly we have influence over that by, as I mentioned, I, I think there's a need for some statewide prioritization and certainly we have some funding opportunities, but this is something where the, the need for uh, watershed scale planning is so broad that it's, it's not something that any one entity can do. Yeah, good. And I, I think that was the intent of the question is thinking about how can we think about something that's so complicated at that scale and be a little bit more deliberate in how we engage with each other. Sounds like some of that's underway. Anyone else want to jump in on that question? Um, I'll, I'll chime in and, and maybe Kellex can then uh, add to it. There is one recommendation in the cutting the green tape recommendations regarding um, well, actually around CEQA, I believe, for landscape scale uh, projects. Uh, and, and one of the things that I thought about that is so in order to incentivize landscape scale planning and detailed watershed planning, you know, what can regulatory agencies or the regulatory process do to make it easier? Yeah. And one of those things would be is, uh, is to potentially uh, enable these watershed plans uh, with a little more detail to be CEQA equivalent documents. And then, you know, kind of extending on say like the RCIS processes and what if a uh, certain level of programmatic permitting came with those documents. You have all of the agencies at the table, you've got all the people there and uh, a lot of the discussions and impact analysis and conditions are repeated over and over and over in different forums. How can we consolidate those repetitive steps and, uh, and make the best use of our funds to do the planning and get the permitting and then get the projects in on the ground. Yeah, that is pretty similar to what I was going to offer, which is that there's nothing in this, uh, the, these recommendations of this report that is about how the state can incentivize watershed planning. It's really about reducing regulatory barriers to restoration. So my thinking is more around, um, if you do have watershed planning, how can you get it implemented? And so there is a recommendation um, 
in the in the document to create a, a, essentially a, a SQL equivalent process for larger uh, scale work. So that because right now you might have a plan for a watershed, but then you have to do different permitting for different properties and different landowners and different applicants and keep doing some similar analysis um, or, or re-demonstrating an analysis that you did for an, another project. Yeah, fantastic. I love how you guys frame that in the context of really the focal area of cutting green tape and then called out how those pieces can intersect and inform each other. So it's amazing to see how much expertise there is in the room today and to hear these voices come forward. We've got another voice here to add to the mix. So Mary Small, thanks for jumping on and joining the panel. Uh, love to hear an update from you. You've got a minute. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about um, the work that the coastal zone management agencies have been doing to see how we could we could adopt the move cutting green tape forward. I'm the deputy uh, executive officer of the Coastal Conservancy, um, and we had a series of conversations with BCDC and the Coastal Commission and OPC, and came up with a set of recommendations um, of sort of how we could we could implement cutting green tape. One is um, Secretary Crowfoot mentioned the Bay uh, Restoration Regulatory Integration um, Team. The Coastal Conservancy has been funding that um, and we are very eager. We're really pleased with the success of that um, early permitting and integration, but trying to figure out how we fund it, how we make it the funding sustainable. Um, because we, we brought in some outside uh, foundation money and some of our own money, but it, we don't have a long-term plan for funding that. Likewise, trying to expand that kind of early integration um, to other areas um, using organiz organizations like the Southern California Wetland Recovery Project to, to bring people together. The second um, focus was really around those the programmatic permits, which you've heard about, um, and really trying to see, and I think the chat reflected this, how we could um, increase the use of those. Sustainable conservation has done amazing work setting them up, but we don't think they're used, we're using them as much as we could, and then seeing if there's opportunities to, to create more of those. Um, and then the last, I think, general category of things is around um, integrating regional monitoring and permit requirements so that we are the monitoring that we're being required to do through our permits feeds into a comprehensive um, kind of monitoring and we're not doing sort of random acts of, of monitoring through our projects. Um, but the Coastal Conservancy is, is so excited about all of this effort and the incredible progress that's been made um, in actually a pretty short time. And we just look forward to, to seeing how we can help move this forward as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much for the update, Mary, and sharing about not only the work you're contributing to, but the learning that's occurring in real time. And so as different tools and resources and processes come online, how do we continue to engage with each other to share those, make sure that we're implementing those or adopting those whenever they make sense for our organization or our partnership, and then continue to share that back so that we can learn and continue to progress as a group. Just doing a time check here. Wow, we covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time, but the, the time is moving quickly. I see your hand. Uh, was that Jen or Chad? I thought I saw Chad's no, hand up. Was Chad, do you, do you want to jump in real there? Real I, quick I thought there? I would because I was also recognizing the time. So thank you. And I'm, I'll be honest, I'm struggling between the Q&A and the questions and trying to look at what everyone's saying. So the comments are great. And I think, you know, I think this is recorded and we'll go back and take some of these and, and of course, try and address them and work work through them or ensure that we're taking this information into our future conversations with parties and, and workshops and things that we have planned. Um, one that I wanna stress, uh, or just at least try and address globally, because I've seen it a couple of times, is about coordination, right? I mentioned this frustration that I hear a lot in this seat when it gets up to my desk about, uh, you know, this region, I got this permit, this region, I got this permit, they're completely different, these people are crazy, how do I deal with this? What are we supposed to do? The department's all over the place. And, and yes, you know, I recognize this happens. You're all dealing with individual staff within our department. Um, there is no one size fits all kind of approach to restoration or permitting for that matter. Um, and so we often get conflicts. Know that we are working hard. I mentioned this collaboration that we're trying to, to build and this culture change. I mean, it's a huge ship, right? The department is a huge ship. Then you take every other state agency, which is a huge ship. They're all trying to turn. We're trying to learn what we want to do and what we want to change. I've pulled in a small set 
small subset of people to say, think about it, figure it out. Now I've also got to go teach our people what we learned and what we're doing. And then they've got to teach you how that works and how that plays out. So yes, we hear you. The permitting is frustrating. Uh, for those of you that weren't in the workshop, please go look back at the materials. It's on our website. I think it was part of this. It's a, it was a three hour, four hour meeting. Those two workshops had over 500 participants and it was awesome. We had a huge Q&A answering half of uh, a lot of these same questions. You can dig through those. I'm happy to, to re reach out to you individually. If you have questions, you can contact me. But we're working on a restoration management permit, which really comes in from our CESA side of 2081A. And through that process, which we're piloting right now on five separate projects throughout the state to really kind of see how it works. But it does have a template. It is trying to streamline restoration permitting. It is really trying to help you all get through that process faster and help us get through it. So that as Jennifer mentioned, we're not, we're not just getting hung up on all these little things. We've figured this out, let's move forward. And the hope is that as the water board comes online with their environmental document, you all will have the ability to use that CEQA flat platform to then turn around and come to the department for a streamlined restoration permit under 2081A. And we can move forward together. We don't need a CD of the water board. We don't need something else. We're working on the federal side with CDs and trying to do a very similar approach. But the goal is to streamline the permitting side on our end, which takes time, one, to develop, and then two, to actually teach our staff how to help you with that how to interact each other. And that's part of this whole process that we're going through right now. It's part of the growing pains. It's part of the learning, all the above. But I promise you, I'm making the commitment to get this right and to make it better than we've been. We do really, really good. When I meet with our staff and I see what's happening, I'm proud of our staff and what they do. Of course, there's hiccups. And of course, we have uh, one-offs and things that go on. And we're working to address those. But please have some patience and know that the point of us having this dialogue and listening to you and he asking you surveys and, and to fill out surveys and do this is so that we can take that information in and start to make that change because we don't want to be frustrated with permits. We definitely don't want to create more confusion and more work for ourselves. So thank you for the comments. We are taking them in and just trust that uh, we're trying our best to really, really think through how we can do this strategically. Awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for jumping back in, Chad. And obviously, there's a lot that we've been able to share in this last hour, a lot that's still within the different um, pers participant perspectives out there. I see some of you are dropping those into the chat box. So thank you for that. I, Erica had her question or hand up at the same time. So I want to quickly turn to Erica and then turn it back to Jen and Wade for a closing comment here. So Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I know we don't have much time here, but, um, you know, in regards to uh, Mary's comment earlier about programmatic permits, maybe not always being used enough, you know, we've talked, I see comments about, you know, how can we move things forward? How can we take advantage of programmatic permits more? And, uh, you know, folks are talking about culture change and whatnot. And we have seen that, you know, once tools are in place, it, it does often really help the agencies shift because, you know, if you put restoration on a separate permitting track, it just empowers agency staff to get more done. But we believe that in the long run, in order to really move all of the pieces of this initiative forward, which are multifaceted, um, one of the main recommend one of the key recommendations that came out of the process was uh, something a more pointed uh, specific type of directive uh, empowering agencies to develop and uh, and um, implement efficient and funding mechanisms, which I see, you know, DFW is working a lot on and other agencies, and also prioritize habitat restoration projects as they move through their process and so and and actively coordinate so this has been a really tough year to get things done. And I was super excited to see uh, uh, something within the recent executive order uh, on habitat, uh, on um, efficient permitting and, and whatnot. But I still think it's gonna be helpful to the agencies and, and help them move things forward if they yeah. have a more specific directive to allow them to prioritize restoration and all of these efficient mechanisms to get things done. Good. No, I appreciate you bringing that forward here. And I appreciate you keeping things short. It's so hard to cram so much great content into such a short amount of time. So with that, Jen and Wade, I invite you forward for any final thoughts that you have. And I see some people are having to jump off. So if you need to go, certainly understand that we are recording this so that people can catch this later if, 
if they need to. So didn't know if Wade, yeah, do you want to come I'll, forward and share a thought? Sure. I think Jen, are you delegating the close to me? You you are the closed. Okay. You're the marquee. Um, listen, <laughs> I think as you've heard uh, from a lot of my colleagues across the state agencies, there's a lot of progress underway. And thanks to the efforts of people in this conversation, you know, we have collectively generated a lot of momentum. And they these are no doubt you know, complicated questions or complex processes to revolve, resolve and improve. But as you've heard, uh, there are so many examples of market measurable progress. So, you know, huge thanks. I had hoped to highlight, for example, in the beginning of my talk, all the work that's happening at the Coastal Commission, the Coastal Conservancies with DFW. Um, and that, for example, is an effort that those entities came together and said, we, we understand what you all are trying to get done on, on cutting green tape. Let's figure out how we can um, achieve it in our own, uh, under our own statutory requirements, et cetera. So there are, uh, there's such great uh, work happening uh, across our agencies. My own take for what it's worth is this is not an issue of political authority anymore. And there do not need to be more directives. I think Karen, Joaquin, Jared, myself, I mean, We've done backflips to, to highlight this as a priority and that we'll do whatever's needed. Um, so I'm looking forward to whatever suggestions, um, you know, you that are not part of state government have. I look forward to these opportunities to update you as ways to hold ourselves accountable for continuing to make progress. I think a point was made in the Q&A that's really important. And this is not um, about simply making things faster or cheaper. Uh, we have to ensure that the projects that are happening continue to be beneficial to the environment. So in, in all of this work, uh, we need to focus on ensuring that we don't sacrifice the quality of the work, uh, nor the necessary reviews that need to ensure intended, not unintended consequences. But I think that there's plenty of room uh, to ensure that we're meeting that mandate while we're helping good projects get done more quickly. And I'm really hopeful in coming months um, this will be a cascading set of, of measurable outcomes. And the practitioners within the conversation today will actually start to experience changes that help these environmental, uh, environmentally beneficial projects happen um, more quickly and cost effectively. Um, the last thing I'll say is I think we all bring a constructive impatience to this. Uh, and we're all not satisfied with the status quo. Um, at, at the same time, there's a lot that we're juggling. Uh, and as Chad mentioned, you know, I think you, you, you understand the passion that we bring to this and the fact that some of these uh, changes will take time. So Sean, I'm really looking forward to continuing our partnership with the Landscape Stewardship Network to bring the broad community of practitioners together along with regulators and state agency personnel to really continue to, to mark progress and uh, identify improvements that we can, we can build into this effort. So thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Secretary Crowfoot. Couldn't have said it better in terms of the opportunity that we have in, in front of us to continue to utilize our, our shared passion, commitment, and energy around these issues in that frame of, of constructive impatience. I really think that that's such a good way to think about it. So thank you, um, Secretary Crowfoot, Secretary Ross, Deputy Secretary Norris, uh, Chad, Paul, Erica, Kellex, everyone, Mary, that joined this has been a fantastic dialogue and exchange. Thank you all for jumping online and being a part of the conversation um, from wherever you are. Uh, glad to have you here with us today. It's obvious that the, the conversation is important, that the work is important, and that the work that you're doing every day to advance this in different spheres and different parts of the states is, is really important as well. So, so grateful to have you and, and your dedication, your commitment, your passion, your experience working towards caring for the land, water, uh, wildlife resources, the state, and for the communities that, that we work with. So thank you so much. In terms of some next steps, we will be sharing a link to this and some follow-ups. If you didn't see it, there was a link in the chat box to the Cutting Green Tape Report on Regulatory Efficiency, as well as Sustainable Conservation's Technical Resource Guide. So we'll make sure that people have access to those and other resources. And then later this year, maybe as soon as late summer 2021, we'll have another convening. So stay tuned for all of those things. In the meantime, um, hope you're doing well. And uh, just again, thanks for being here. Take care until the next time.